This is the story of Dracula, a creature who destroys all whom he touches. Christopher Lee single-handedly helped British cinema become a mainstay player in Hollywood. How do you destroy a fiend? His sensational portrayal of the Transylvanian Count Dracula was instantly branded as a defining modern take on the horror icon. All that is evil. The popularity eventually led Lee to reprise this role ten more times in the following years. Bringing terror and death across 4,000 years. To fulfil his contract, the famed performer was obliged to appear in the guise of several different classic movie monsters. This formula proposed by the producers worked, and ticket sales both at home and abroad flourished. But despite receiving the crown of horror cinema, Lee had mixed feelings about being typecast and eventually decided to set out for new ventures. The governments of all the nations do not accept my terms. To escape the trappings of his scary image in England and Hollywood, the veteran actor lent his talents to low-budget European co-productions. She is Omar Pasha's favourite. We must kill her. Take her away. With his name receiving top billing, these motion pictures turned into bankable cult franchises themselves. I need Heracles to complete my plan. The 1990s saw the late actor make a brief but significant comeback in movies directed by artists who grew up as his fans. How much have your superiors explained to you? These ahead of their time postmodern motion pictures received praise from critics for their self-referential humour, focusing on Lee's star persona. Sauron's forces have begun their attack. But it was in his late 70s that Christopher Lee reached the actual peak of his global celebrity status. Two important roles in Hollywood's biggest franchises, Star Wars and The Lord of the Rings, not only introduced the British thespian to a new generation of moviegoers, but cemented his position in the annals of cinema history. And who better to give us some insight into this screen legend than Christopher Lee's official biographer, Jonathan Rigby. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. Now, while most genre actors of his generation were forgotten by the 1980s, Christopher Lee wasn't. How did he manage to maintain a successful career that spans more than six decades? Well, he was a great friend of his uh horror contemporaries, if you like, Vincent Price and Peter Cushing. And I think he'd be the first to want me to point out that uh, Price and Cushing weren't forgotten by the 1980s. They were, uh, in fact, they're not forgotten now. They're still remembered and loved by many. But by the 1980s, they were slowing down, if you like. They were semi-retired. Because in that regard, I think Lee's advantage over them was that he was a little bit younger. He was uh, 11 years younger than Vincent Price and nine years younger than Peter Cushing. So um, in many ways, in the 80s, he was uh, entering his uh, sort of autumnal maturity and was uh, still a very sought after actor, whereas they were uh, in, uh, approaching retirement, if you like. So um, he, was, um, he was just that bit younger than them and able to capitalize on a new breed of young filmmakers who'd grown up watching his work. And are there any little-known facts you discovered about Christopher Lee while writing the authorised screen history? Well, you know, one of the best-kept secrets about Christopher Lee that I discovered was what a charming and very funny man he was. He was a fund of, of droll anecdotes, and he, um, he was a man of boyish enthusiasms. You know, if you went round to his place in Cadogan Square here in London, you know, he'd um, offer you a glass of Aquavit, which was his favorite drink. And one day he might show you his, uh, his, uh, his beloved collection of Special Forces insignia. Another day he might show you his collection of Ian Fleming, James Bond first editions. Um, I say it's a, one of the best kept secrets about him because he was a very imposing figure. And I think people tended to find him somewhat intimidating. And uh, I think he had a, a bit of a reputation as being rather haughty and, and chilly. And I think that was a lot to do with the fact that, like many actors, he was rather shy. And that came across as, as, as being rather um, inflexible and, and slightly intimidating. But in private, he wasn't like that at all. He was absolutely charming and very funny to be with. And I enjoyed, um, I enjoyed every occasion that I was with him. OK, Jonathan, and how would you describe his acting style? Well, I, th I think I've given a few um, 
clues to that already. He was extremely imposing, six feet four inches, very aristocratically good looking. In fact, for a long time at the beginning of his career, British casting directors resisted casting him because his height was so much taller than the average British leading man of the time. And also they felt he was a bit, a bit exotic looking, as they would have said in those days. He, was, he had Italian blood. Uh, on his mother's side and um, so he was tall and uh, exotic and they weren't sure how to place him. Happily uh, gothic horror came along and, um, and so he was perfectly matched with that. So but he was he... imposing, he was a real presence, he was a real presence. He did have and as mixed... I say he was remarkable at movement and mime. He did have mixed feelings though about being known solely as a horror icon. How did he deal with that? And he always acknowledged that but after about ten years or so of effectively being typed in horror films, and this was a period he referred to as his graveyard period. After ten years or so of that, he was quite reasonably getting a bit bored. And happily, um, in 1969, Billy Wilder cast him as Mycroft Holmes in a film called The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes. And from that springboard, suddenly casting directors loosened up and thought we can look up upon him in different ways. And uh, after that, he was in big international movies like The Three Musketeers and playing Scaramanga in The Man with the Golden Gun, which I think is one role people remember him very fondly for. And um, the typecasting fell away. I think he... Um, he got particularly irritated, however, right up to the end. He was very irritated when journalists came along and all they wanted to talk to him about was Dracula. Um, I can tell you that in private he was quite happy to talk about Dracula. He, had, he actually had quite a pronounced interest in, you know, the supernatural and stuff like that. You know, he was a very, very fond of ghost and horror stories. So it was a special interest of his, but he just got bored if all he was ever asked about was, was Dracula. And, and I can understand that. You, uh, actors always being asked the same question all the time, I think they do get rapidly rather bored. And um, he, could be quite, he could be quite terse with people who did just want to focus on Dracula. I can imagine. Jonathan Rigby, a fascinating insight into an iconic actor. Thank you very much. Thank you.